and so it's a rather fascinating area of research. Uh, when I first started typing up the slides for this, I called it energy storage, uh, etc., because I really wasn't sure where it was going to go. And I've got about 50 slides in the deck. Uh, we might not get through all of it. I'm very, very happy to take questions as we go, and that will help guide my uh, discussion as to what, what we, we talked about. Um, yeah, so please uh, stick your hand up if you've got any questions or comments. Uh, it's actually a little bit daunting for me talking to this room because I recognise there's an enormous amount of expertise in this room and people have been thinking about these problems a lot longer than I have. So uh, I won't be too surprised if I learn a few things myself this evening as well. So please, uh, uh, any uh, contributions will be very welcome. Uh, as Rob said, I'm a senior lecturer at Monash University in Resources Engineering. I'm quite new at Monash. I've only been there for two months. Uh, prior to that, I was the Deputy Director of the Melbourne Energy Institute at the University of Melbourne. Uh, did that job for four or five years and was at Melbourne University before that. Uh, my background is atmospheric science. I have a PhD in atmospheric physics, uh, but I've gradually migrated away from climate change and carbon cycle to fossil emissions and then the solution to the climate change problem, which of course is renewable energy. So I feel like I've, I've you know, had, had quite an interesting career path and I've gone from fundamental science through economics to engineering. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been a good trip. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, maybe not covering everything and maybe covering some extra things in between. Uh, first of all, just talk about pumped hydro energy storage. So yeah, PHES, pumped hydro energy storage. Uh, what is the role of pumped hydro or storage in general in the energy system? Uh, and we'll talk about a range of different storage technologies and how they differ. Uh, there, there's no silver bullet, they all have different characteristics, there's no one size fit all in the energy storage game. Uh, and then I'm going to look at a, a couple of case studies. And uh, one in particular at the moment is a, a feasibility study underway looking at seawater pumped hydro at Kultana in South Australia. So that's a, a really interesting project. I also uh, completed a, a small pre-feasibility study looking at uh, small scale pumped hydro in the Euroa area for a, a community group there, which I'll, I'll talk about very briefly. Lots of people are talking about lithium-ion batteries. I'm, I'm not particularly pro on lithium-ion batteries at the moment. I'll, I'll explain my reasoning for that. I, I suspect some people in this room are probably quite pro uh, having a power wall or equivalent. Um, so I'm, hopefully we'll have some, uh, some interesting discussions about that. And the last thing I'll talk about is the, my, my core research, which is total system integration. So looking at the whole energy system and saying, given we have a very broad range of technology choices available to us, what is the, the best combination of those technologies? And, and what affects that choice? Um, is it, it's the cost of the technologies, it's the resources available, and it's the policy settings, as well as um, what, what, what we actually you know, choose to make work. So a lot of the work I'm, I'm showing tonight has been uh, initiated, completed, or discussed with, with many other people. So. There's a, a list of people here. I'm sure many of you know Tim Forsey, regular contributor to Renew magazine. Uh, Patrick Herbst, Dylan, Mike Sandiford, uh, all contributed to the uh, original uh, pre-feasibility study for the Kultana project. And Peter Seligman, who's sitting in the audience here tonight, was the uh, originator of the original idea for getting the pre-feasibility study going. So you know, if, if the pumped seawater hydro system in Kultana gets built, it's it's, it's, it's thanks to Peter, so uh, definitely a, an acknowledgement to, to Peter as well. Uh, the, the model I'll be showing for doing the PV battery work was put together by Chris Cooper, so I acknowledge him as well. The Kultana work has been done by a very large uh, group of people, and I, won't, I haven't listed all their names, I've just listed them as the EA, Energy Australia and ARAP teams. Um, the Energy, Melbourne Energy Institute supported a lot of this work, and the work, uh, a lot of the work we've, we've done has been funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. So we uh, acknowledge ARENA as well. OK. Any questions so far? All good. OK. So fairly obvious. I think you know, everyone will be fairly appreciative at this point. The role of storage is to smooth out the demand curve. So uh, actually, if I just skip forward to my, my figure here. So this is a very traditional sort of view of a, of a demand curve, load curve. You might have a peak here. Can you see that? Peak here in the 
late afternoon, early evening, and low demand overnight. And the role of the storage is to chop off the top of the peak and to fill in the troughs, to try and make the load curve as flat as possible. And so the, the, the reason for doing this, if I just going back to my slide there, was to allow large inflexible generators, such as a nuclear power station, to be able to load follow. So the partnership between pumped hydro and a nuclear power station, or indeed a brown coal fired power station, was, was a beautiful marriage because it allowed your uh, you know, high capital cost base load power station to run at more or less constant output and use the pumped hydro to soak up the excess when uh, the demand was low and uh, act as a, a peaking generator in the evening. Now in today's world, that traditional demand curve is, is looking less and less common. And so I forgot to put a plot in, but I should have shown the, the duck curve, which I'm sure you've heard of, that as the penetration of PV goes up, we're actually seeing a decrease in the afternoon uh, peak demand, because uh, PV effectively works as a demand uh, reducer. And so uh, we're actually seeing that uh, low price events, low demand events are happening in the middle of the day rather than the middle of the night. As far as the storage is concerned, it doesn't really care. The, its job is to look at whenever there's low demand, soak up the excess power and put it back onto the grid during the peak uh, times. So pumped hydro itself, it's a, it's a reasonably straightforward uh, technology. Uh, this particular diagram was put together by um, Arup, and so that's why we're talking about having the sea as the bottom reservoir here, because we're talking about the seawater pumped hydro scheme uh, proposed for Kultana. Essentially, you have a, a reversible generator turbine. Uh, it has to be a Francis-type uh, generator, so it can be reversed. So it's a pump. Uh, you can run it as a pump, you draw power off the grid, and pump water up a penstock into an upper reservoir. And then the same piece of kit works as a generator when you want to run the water back down the hill to put power back on the grid. So yeah, there's, there's really nothing particularly exciting about this. Um, in this particular schematic, we've got the penstock above the ground here, because that's what we're planning on doing at Kultana. Quite often the penstock can be in a tunnel and go underground via this path. But usually the Arrangement is, is pretty much the same. Top reservoir at the top of a hill, bottom reservoir obviously at the bottom. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the top end of the Spencer Gulf. Uh, the physics of, of pumped hydro is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, you've got um, the potential energy is the mass times gravity times H, the, the head height. So the bigger the head, the bigger the elevation difference, the more energy you can store for the same amount of water. So it's, it's fairly critical to be able to have a, a cost-effective scheme uh, is to have a reasonably good head height. And uh, the, the studies we've done at the University of Melbourne showed that 100 metres was the absolute minimum, and if you had above 200 metres, you're pretty happy. If you get up to 300 metres, then life's looking pretty good. So uh, that's the sort of um, scenario, uh, elevation difference we're looking at. If you use that, that straightforward mathematics, a 100 megalitre reservoir, that would be 100 metres by 100 metres by 10 metres, so you know, a, a large farm reservoir, if you like. Um, if you had 300 metres of head, that would store uh, 294 gigajoules, which is the same as 82 megawatt hours. So 82 megawatt hours, if you have a 20 megawatt plant, that's four hours of storage. So that's sort of just trying to give you a, a sense of what the scale of this, this kind of thing is. People often ask me, oh, could, we, could we put pumped hydro in our high-rise buildings? Or we had a, a tank at the top of the building and we ran water up and down. You can do the mathematics and you can show that you'd have to have actually quite a large tank. Because you know, even a skyscraper, you might be lucky if it's 300 metres high. So if you're going to store the amount of energy that's required in a building like that, you're probably going to need to fill up a fair, fair amount of the building with water. So it's, uh, it's not really a go up. But um, yeah, the, the maths is very, very straightforward. On the other end of the scale, if you looked at some uh, features like the Thompson Reservoir, that's big enough, uh, looking at the elevation differences in the area, to sc store around 500 gigawatt hours. So you can see why hydro uh, in general is such an attractive uh, technology. Uh, really, very large amounts of energy is stored in these water reserves. So if we look at what the mix of storage technologies is around the world at the moment, and this is for technologies storing electrical energy. 
So there, there are other ways of, of storing energy. You can store energy in fossil fuel, for example. So I'm not talking about that kind of energy storage. This is uh, energy storage connected directly to an electricity system. The vast majority, you can see you know, the, the, the red pie chart here, you know, the other, the ones that aren't pumped hydro is almost invisible. So 99% of the world's energy storage at the moment is done through pumped hydro. And that is because it's the most cost effective. Technically, it's very straightforward. Um, so it's, it's, it's really an ideal mix. It has a num number of other... other